Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Stone, the uh, executive director of the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice at the Jacksonville Urban League. Uh, I want to welcome all of you, uh, and I want to particularly thank the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and the interns at uh, the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice for putting this circle together. Um, it's, we've had a number of these circles and we've learned so much from one another and also have made these uh, recordings available for uh, citizens who would like to learn more about uh, the Sheriff's Office and what's going on in the city relative to uh, dealing with crime and improving uh, public safety general. Uh, so I'm really excited um, to have uh, uh, Jamie Krasnigor help uh, with facilitation and um, our two interns that she will introduce to give you their backgrounds and um, mention the work that they've done for this. So with that, I will take it away. I, I want to apologize to everyone for not, this is the first town hall of the Urban League in in over two years that I won't be able to attend. I have a function at church that I have to give a talk at and there's no way for somebody else to substitute. So, but I'm looking forward to the video. With that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Jamie. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I just wanna thank um, Caroline and Vivian for the amazing work that they have done. And um, Caroline, you are screen sharing, so I'll let you start to present. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am currently an intern for the Jacksonville Urban League Center for Advocacy and Social Justice, and Vivian and I will be co-hosting this event. Before we get started, I will just go over a quick agenda for the meeting. So we will have our introductions for our presenters, then we'll have a quick presentation by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office on their recruitment and training. And then we will have Buck Squad present, which is a local Charlottesville organization that um, specializes in de-escalation training. And then we will have time for a Q&A with um, members of the community and our speakers tonight. And then we will have our closing. So we have the Dennis and Jamie um, kind of introduced already. So from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, we have Assistant Chief uh, TJ Cox, who is the Training Center Director. We also have Sergeant Christopher Jones and Sheriff Pat Ivey. From Buck Squad, we have Herb Locus, who is the Executive Director, and Brian Page, who is the Assistant Executive Director. I would just like to thank you guys for coming out tonight and taking time out of your busy schedule to um, join us in this community engagement circle. With that, um, we are going to go into the application process with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. All right, uh, so good evening. I am uh, Sergeant Jones, Christopher Jones with Jacksonville Sheriff's Office uh, Recruitment Selection Unit. Um, I've been in that position now for about three years, uh, 20 years in the business, if you will, between corrections and uh, police. So I was asked to kind of go over uh, our application process from more or less the beginning to the end. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do right now. And if you have any questions about any of that stuff, I'll be happy to, to uh, answer those questions. So uh, and I'm going to be reading off some notes here. So I apologize that I keep looking over to the side. But uh, so basically an applicant determines that they want to apply with us, whether it be that we go out and reach out to them. Uh, at a recruiting event, or they just decide, hey, I want, I'm interested in that. I'm going to, you know, I've always wanted to be the police or work in corrections. So they go on our website, they determine what they can apply for based off of what they qualify for uh, and um, what they want to do, you know. So they may want to be the police, but they may not qualify based off of our education and experience standards that we have listed on our website. They decide to make an application. They do so, they go through uh, ISOMS. It's a program that we use. It's very effective. Uh, we were able to hire people at a much higher rate. When I came on, it took about six months with a paper application. Uh, and now we could do it in a month. Uh, that's not ideal, but we can. 
uh, if we need to. And that is a, that's still doing a complete background with, uh, you know, we're not cutting any corners at all. So they do that. Uh, they put their application in through that application system. We review it. A uh, staff member checks it for accuracy and completeness. Uh, and then they move along in the process. So uh, the next thing that happens is they receive a conditional offer of employment. That is, uh, you know, everybody gets that that puts the application in. Basically, that means if they complete their everything, we decide to hire them. That is their conditional offer. Uh, it's something that we're required to do by uh, human resources. So they receive that. Uh, they'll also get a link to a hiring packet. Uh, that hiring packet is uh, it's all, all virtual. Every bit of it is on the, online on the computer. They don't have to bring us any paperwork really, uh, really ever at all. Uh, so they fill that out and they have to put on there a bunch of stuff. That takes could take an hour or two for them to fill it out. It's very complete, it goes back 10 years, all their jobs, residences, uh, any kind of criminal history, education, military history, things like that. Uh, it's a really good snapshot of who they are in their life, um, stuff we need for the background, things like that. So following that, I know this is kind of lengthy, but it's a, uh, you know, a month long process condensed into a little, uh, you know, um, what I'm doing. Uh, the hiring packet is reviewed for completeness and the applicant uh, is invited to a pre-employment screening event. So basically what we do is they bring them out. We bring them out on either a Saturday or a Wednesday, uh, Saturday morning or Wednesday night. We do four, do these four times a month. That is uh, more for their, the applicant's convenience than ours. So they have plenty of opportunity to get out there. Uh, they'll come out and usually last about five to six hours, that event. But as that is really their, uh, that's their jump off point in the process that really shows that they're serious and allows us to uh, do what we really need to do and get them in the process, physically in the process. So they're going to do a, uh, a physical abilities test. You can change the slide if you like. Um, they're going to do a physical abilities test or a PAT, uh, an officer course type run is what that is. They also will do a one mile run. Uh, they will take do their polygraph packet. Uh, that packet is just paperwork. They're not actually going to do their polygraph test where they're hooked up to the machine that day or that night. They just fill out this packet uh, more or less. Uh, it's about 200 questions. Takes, takes applicants about an hour. Sounds extremely daunting, but it's not. Um, it's it's really all the good and the bad you know have you ever done you know xyz you know drug usage criminal history things like that are on there and a lot of other things also so uh, they fill that out uh, we check it make sure that there aren't any glaring issues that we need to uh, address that evening or that morning and then they move on in the process uh, from there there's a, a physical fitness preparation powerpoint uh, idea behind that is we can give them some information to prepare for the academy prior to showing up. Uh, you have to be physically ready before day one. You can't show up out of shape. Uh, and the last thing we do at that event is a writing skills assessment. Uh, assessment. They watch a video and then after that they write a police report if you will. It's not we don't expect them to know how to, to write a police report. Um, that's way down the road in training. Uh, but this is just more or less, hey, can you watch the video and put down in uh, intelligible English what you saw? And uh, you know that's the last part of that event. So, all right. So they complete that event and then we will uh, begin scheduling them for all their other tests, such as a polygraph exam, their uh, medical and their psychological. So. Uh, this is the bulk of our lift, if you will, the process. So those things that I just mentioned occur. I assign them to a background investigator. I have about 13 background investigators that work for our shop. They are all, every one of them is a retired JSO. Either they were a sergeant or a detective, but every one of them at least served in investigations at some point in their career. Um, not a requirement for that job, but it definitely helps because they understand investigations and how to use tools. 
to um, to vet people. And that's really what we're doing is we're vetting them. So uh, those members are retired, but they work part time for us and they do vet rounds. And that's that's just that's what they do for us. So they're really good at what they do. And um, so uh, we put them through the background. We get them to polygraph. Uh, I'm sorry, we get them to polygraph and then we, they do their test, depending if they have any issues or not. We'll make that that determination then. Uh, I kind of skipped around here. I'm sorry. Uh, polygraph first. After polygraph, then we send them into background. Into background, that's when they do their medical and their psychological. The medical is nothing more than a physical uh, with a, a stress test. Uh, they hook you up with the EKG and um, make sure you're physically able to do the job. The psychological, you go to a, uh, a contracted doctor uh, for the city. We have a psychiatrist and he will review you basically an interview. And also um, you answer, I don't know what they're called, the MMP or uh, Minnesota. It's Minnesota something. There's a, a, a very long five, 600 questions, ex uh, I won't say exam, but questionnaire that you do while you're there and that's reviewed. And then the psychologist makes a determination whether or not you're suitable for police work, community service, uh, corrections, et cetera. All right, so the, you go through background, um, you're assigned a recruiter, that recruiter becomes your main point of contact and they will assist you with any problems that you may have. Uh, we are incredibly effective at maintaining contact. When I came through 20 years ago, you'd get a letter in the mail about once a month telling you what your next step was, telling you if you passed the first step and then, hey, this is the next step, be here this date and time. Uh, well, things have, things have changed over the years. We call applicants, we text applicants, we use ISIMS, uh, this program we have to send emails to them. Um, we maintain weekly contact and when we, if they have a scheduling issue, we fix it and we work with them. Uh, we're glad to. Again, things have changed over the years. We're not, hey, you can't make your appointment. Well, that's too bad because you don't want a job. Uh, we go, okay, well, when can you and how can we make this work? Uh, so we really work with, with work with people now. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So I kind of covered the background investigator ahead of time. I skipped around a little bit, but that background investigator fully vets the applicant, checks all those things I've got on the screen there, the applicant's work history, military history, law enforcement, if that's uh, applicable, talks to references, supervisors, checks for criminal history, driving history, and really looks for anything else that we might need to know about. Uh, you know, we, we do look at things that could be morally or, or ethically a concern, uh, you know, something may have happened in your past and we need to uh, we need to talk about it and see if it's something that we can uh, accept or not. Uh, so after uh, I already covered the bottom part there to the medical and the psychological. So those are those. Uh, so following all of that, uh, the lieutenant who's actually on tonight too, uh, Lieutenant Derek Boucher has made it on. Uh, myself and the lieutenant, we will review the uh, entire background. We review everything actually that comes through um, and we make a determination whether or not they are uh, able to move along in the process. So is there anything that has occurred that we've determined or discovered or that they've told us that would is disqualifying? And that is based off of our written standards, our guidelines that are provided by the sheriff and the sheriff's upper staff, the director, chief level. Um, those are, that's kind of our guideline and it's what it is, is a guide. So uh, if they're good to go and we're gonna send them to the board, we will send them to the oral board and that is their chance to really sell themselves. That is their interview. Um, unlike other agencies where you may interview with just one particular chief or a staff member, we have a board of three and generally they are not involved in the uh, entire application and processing process. They are, um, they don't know you. And this is your chance to uh, really convince them that you're a good fit for our agency. Um, so uh, 
they will ask you a series of questions that are generic, um, pros, cons to yourself, weaknesses, things like that. Um, again, chance to sell yourself. And also they may have to answer any questions that if we found something that was a kind of of concern with uh, them and their background or the polygraph, they may be asked those questions and they kind of get called on the carpet and have to dispel any concerns we may have. So they complete that. Uh, they move along from the board. Uh, that entire file is sent over to the chief of professional standards uh, for review. Um, that chief will look at absolutely everything from the from their physical abilities test score on day one. How did they do physically to the last letter and the last word on their OR board? You know, absolutely everything, background. And then that chief makes the ultimate final decision if we are going to hire that person. So um, chief makes that decision, lets Lieutenant know, uh, Lieutenant Boucher, and the Lieutenant is gonna then push that information out to myself, human resources, and the recruiting staff that are over that particular applicant so that we can let the applicant know as soon as possible because we know that they are on pins and needles wanting to know how things went and if they were going to have a job or not so we do that and then we maintain contact if that happens a few weeks or a month out we're going to maintain contact with them and um you know make sure everything's going good and smooth and we we get them we get them going day one um last thing we do is, is hand them off to the uh, training staff on day one, and then they are they're with the training staff, and that's uh, Chief Cox's uh, personnel. Uh, the last thing I wanted to add is we also offer what are called voluntary workouts every other Tuesday. We do those at the academy. That's actually run by the training staff, and it's a good opportunity for people that are not in good shape or they're concerned about their physical fitness, they can come out and it's completely voluntary. We put them through this, we put them through a workout and uh, we kind of get them spun up on how they're going to be working out in the academy. I think it's a huge tool, not just to get a workout in, but you also understand what to expect day one and at the academy. And I think that also helps with clearing out some of those uh, butterflies you may have about what's going to happen. You know, are they going to beat me up? No, we're not. So that's that. If you have any questions, I can certainly answer them. Hi, um, my name's Joe Lita. I'm with uh, Mayo Clinic. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, in, the, sure. in the last uh, year or so, has there been a drop in the number of applicants able to uh, meet all of the requirements and get to that date of hire? So I would say there's not been a drop in applicants able to get to that point, but there has been a noticeable drop in applicants in general. Uh, I would say about a year ago, and I don't have the, that data in front of me, but a year, year and a half ago, um, we were easily receiving 200 plus applications for police, uh, police officer, and another 200 plus applications for corrections uh, which are two separate positions and now on average monthly we are getting about 60 to 80 applicant applications per so uh, they pretty much run neck and neck police and corrections as far as how many applications uh, just by it's just the way it is uh, and yes they have dropped significantly um, but out of those 80 Percentage wise, we're probably still running neck and neck percentage wise on how many are viable applicants versus the 200, 250. So um, we get good quality, but we do also get people that we, we just can't hire. Right. Um, the other question I have is um, in the beginning, you talk about um, applicants, they have. Um, education and experience requirements. What are the experience requirements? Sure, let me, uh, give me one second. I'm gonna pull it up here real quick. It'd be a lot easier than trying to go off the top of my head. <clears throat> so I will tell you this, when it comes to CSO, community service officer, all they have to have is a high school diploma or a GED. 
and be 18 years of age or older. And that is exactly the same for corrections officer. Same standards, high school diploma, GED, uh, and 18 years of age or older. That used to be 19. Governor DeSantis did lower that um, a year or two years ago to 18. Uh, you do have to be a citizen of the United States or a naturalized citizen of the U.S. to be a corrections or police officer. You do not have to be a U.S. citizen to be a civilian with the sheriff's office, which includes CSO and any of the other support positions. And just give me one second to pull that other stuff up here. All right, so there are currently 10 different ways that you can get in the door as a, uh, and be qualified as a police officer. And I'll just kind of uh, read those to you. So either you have a bachelor's degree, so an actual bachelor's degree by an accredited college or university. Um, you complete, or really you haven't quite completed it yet, but you're enrolled in and completing the Edward uh, Waters Uni University uh, three plus one criminal justice program. Um, that is something we partnered with uh, probably about two years ago, maybe a little bit longer with EWU in town. Uh, and just to kind of ex explain that, because you're probably like, well, what's the three plus one program? Uh, a, a person that's a student at this school enrolls in this program. It is criminal justice tracked. It's called three plus one because the first three years you're actually going to college. You're taking your criminal justice courses and your, your core classes and things like that. Your last year, you're actually in the academy. So your senior year, what would be your senior year? You start the academy. So what we have done is that person may not meet the criteria in and of itself because they don't, they don't have a four-year degree yet and they don't meet any of the other criteria I'm going to tell you about. However, if they're in that program, we will preemptively, presumptively hire them as a police recruit to be a police officer and put them through the academy, pay for it, pay them just like anybody else. And upon completion and graduation from that and passing the state exam, which everyone has to do, they are then, uh, you know, well, they're not then, they're already hired, but that's just all part of it. So that is a good way to get in is to go through that program. Um, okay, so the other ones now, uh, there are, if you have four years of continuous active military service, that will get you in the door with a high school diploma or GED. You don't have to have any college. Uh, four years of full-time law enforcement experience at another agency anywhere in the United States. Uh, anywhere uh, in the, we also will look at um, Puerto Rico, places like that, that are part of the U.S. Um, the, the word is, not in my head as far as what those are. Um, but so police experience four years or more with a high school diploma or GED. Four years of continuous, sorry, not four years continuous, four years currently employed. So I guess that would be continuous as a JSO corrections officer, CSO certified bailiff or judicial officer and a high school diploma or GED is all you need. So if we have somebody that's worked in our jail for four years or more, or they've been a CSO from four years or more, they're good to go. They don't need anything else. Okay. The rest of these I'm going to read you do require at least an associate's degree or 60 college credits or more. And those credits, um, I hate to say it like this, but we don't really care what they're in. If they're all, if you did 60 college credits worth of electives, uh, okay. I mean, you may have wasted your time, but that, that is sufficient for us as long as your official transcript shows us 60 or more college credits we're okay with that uh so was, five years yeah excuse me Sorry, i was i was yeah. looking more at uh not so much the education but the experience part and that experience is more for uh 
pol uh, police officers, correct? Yes, this is all for police. So okay. the education and the experience, they're married up. They're together. So the ones I'm about to read you require you to also have, also have an associate's degree or 60 college credits or more. So five years of continuous full-time employment anywhere. Mm -hmm. Don't care. McDonald's, um, the corporate world, don't care. Just five years full-time work and an associate's degree or higher with 60 college or 60 college credits. Four years of service in the military reserves or more, mm -hmm. a little bit different than active duty with that associate's. Four years continuous employed employment as a full-time civilian with the JSO. So anybody that maybe is a dispatcher, uh, we've got some processing right now that are dispatchers. They have more than four years and, and they have that associate's degree or 60 college credits. Somebody that has two years full-time law enforcement experience anywhere else and that associates or 60 college credits. And lastly, I know this is a long list, two years currently employed as a JSO corrections officer, community service officer, bailiff, or judicial officer. And bailiffs and judicial officers work in the courthouse for clarification. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and again, those that two years in that job with an associates or 60 college credits. So uh, as you can see, a lot of these are the same. It's just two years with an associates or four years with just a high school diploma or GED. Mm -hmm. So those are the education and experience requirements. Thank you so much. I appreciate the information. Absolutely. You're very welcome. And that can be found on our website too. Um, if, just so you know. Uh, thank you, Sergeant Jones. I think now we are going to kind of transition into another presentation about a few specific topics within the training that uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's officers receive. Uh, hey, Carolyn, uh, I had one question on here. Can I answer it real quick? Oh, yes, of course. Sorry, I didn't see the chat. Sorry. I know, no worries. It just popped up for me. Um, so your, your question, uh, Jerry, I think, um, is as far as what are we doing to uh, respond to better diverse police forces strategy for using your agency to recruit more minority applicants. So, um, so I'll tell you in our shop, we have out of the five recruiters we have, three of them are African-American. Um, that's not trying to wave our flag, look at us, but uh, they're all phenomenal at what they do. Uh, and I'll get to your question. Uh, one is Andy Latimer. He's, he's been in recruiting since I got hired. He's been there forever. Wealth, wealth of information phenomenal at reaching out to our minority applicants and population great at it uh, we also have uh, felicia williams she is a navy reserve um, member up for chief which is great she's really really doing well there uh, in the reserves and she is a corrections officer we also have and lastly we have derek holsey uh, who actually served in the marine corps with oddly enough our past went different ways and we came back it's kind of strange, but hey, it's a small world. Uh, he's a retired master sergeant from the Marine Corps and uh, he is also great at doing that. So as far as targeting minority, we go to every uh, college that we can go to, you know, the historical black university or colleges, HBCUs. Uh, we go to every single one of them that we possibly can. Uh, we go into the communities, uh, whether it be they're doing some kind of community meeting or job fair that is there. Uh, we're in those areas uh, all the time. Uh, absolutely trying to not just require, uh, recruit minority. I mean, really, we want to try to recruit the best qualified applicant. Um, but absolutely, 100%, we want our agency to reflect our community um, on every level, whether it just be African-American or uh, Hispanic population, Asian, which we know is kind of underserved in the, um, we know that in the law enforcement can be uh, under representative, not underserved, I don't mean to say that, underrepresented on the uh, law enforcement. So uh, we want to do that. So I hope that answered your question. 
And if there are no many, no more questions on recruiting, I would like to switch um, into the presentations on um, specific trainings that officers receive. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. On behalf of Sheriff Pat Ivey, I'm Assistant Chief Travis Cox, and uh, thank you all for having us this evening. Uh, I get excited when we talk about training because I think training is one of those big misconceptions that, that the average citizen has about law enforcement, about how we train, what we train. And unfortunately, some people get their perception of what law enforcement does on a day-to-day -day basis through either television or media. So hopefully I can um, clear up some of those misconceptions and kind of give you an overview of what our training program looks like for a police recruit uh, from the time they get hired to the time they actually leave our building and starts sitting and riding in a police car. So um, just to give you an overview of the training, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, our training campus out there at the Northeast Florida, North Florida Criminal Justice Center, we train in five particular areas. We do police, law enforcement, corrections, our community service officers, which you heard uh, Sergeant Jones talk about. And then we do advanced and specialized training, which is basically that that training is done for specialized units for officers that are already on the street and they're just honing their skills. For example, if someone is a patrol officer, but now they want to go to the homicide unit, they may take an advanced or specialized course in interviewing or death investigation. So those type of classes are ran at the academy as well as remedial training. Our biggest area of remedial training, believe it or not, is in driving. We have officers that tend to crash every now and then. So we have to uh, do some remedial training on driving and then we do other topics as well. So those are the five main areas that we train at the academy. And I'm gonna talk more specifically to law enforcement training this evening. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So how long is the academy? Our recruits are in our building for about nine months. So that's 790 hours of the basic law enforcement training. That training is uh, recommend, not recommend, is required by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So any person that wants to be a police officer in the state of Florida has to go through that 790 hours. And that's roughly about six months. So once a person goes through that, they go through the basic law enforcement academy, they have to sit for the state exam, they pass the state exam, and then they move on to another three months of training that 440 hours, and that's JSL orientation training. So during those last, uh, I'm sorry, three months, those last three months, those 440 hours, we're teaching the recruit the JSO policies and procedures because every agency is a little bit different. So we wanna make sure that the new police officers or those recruits understand how JSO will investigate a domestic call or how JSO handles a barricaded suspect and everything like that. So we test them on these procedures. There's practical applications and they have to demonstrate the ability, whether it's firearms or driving or building searches or how we respond to an active shooter. All those things are covered in that next uh, 440 hours. So our recruits have now been with us for nine months and they graduate our program, they get sworn in and then they start the FTO program. That's called the field training officer program. That next 13 weeks, the officers, those recruits are now riding with another officer, a training officer. So they go through four different phases, phases one through four, and each phase and each day is graded. They get what we call a daily observation report where the senior officer is grading their performance each day and teaching and training that officer how to respond to calls. So, those nine months that they're with us, they get the book knowledge, they get the practical application and scenario-based training. And then that 13 weeks, they apply what they've learned at the academy, and then they take it onto the street. So what I really want you to know here, one of the things I want you to know is that from the day the recruit starts the academy until the day that they're on their own, driving in their own police car, answering calls for service is approximately about 13 months. So a little over a year. So basically the, the officer we hire today is replacing the officer that's leaving in October of 2023. 
that's how long it takes. So when we you hear about, hey, we want to hire another 50 officers or 60 officers or 70 officers, we have to project forward, you know, 13 months in advance because that's how long it takes to get an officer uh, prepared to go on the street. Uh, next slide, please. So here are just a couple of the topics. I, obviously, I didn't want to list everything that occurs in those nine months that they're at the academy. But some of the classroom topics we talk about and some of the big ones that as you know, de-escalation and domestic violence and human trafficking, uh, stress awareness, that's being something, you know, the emotional intelligence of officers as well as officer wellness, that's becoming more and more prevalent in recruit training um, due to two main things, the high, high rate of divorce in law enforcement families and the high rate of suicide of officers. So we try to give the recruits more tools on how to handle stress and ma manage stress and release stress. And so those are some of the classroom topics. And then on the other side, some of the high liabilities. And one of the big differences of the high liabilities, not only do they have to take a written exam to show proficiency, they also have to demonstrate. So they do a practical exam. So we have to, they have to demonstrate how to put a tourniquet on someone. They have to demonstrate uh, proficiency using a firearm and, and so on. So those are just some of the topics that we talk about and we train at the academy while our recruits are there. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in preparing for this, I was uh, asked a couple questions and I wanna talk about a couple of things that are critical to not only the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, but law enforcement. And a lot of these things have occurred based on events that have happened nationwide uh, within the law enforcement community. So one of the things that we want to talk about, uh, I want to mention is the duty to intervene. So we changed this policy um, roughly probably September of uh, 2020 after the George Floyd incident. And I won't read it to you verbatim, uh, but that's what the policy says. I, I basically cut it straight out of our policy book so you have it. But basically, we put in writing that if an officer observes another officer using unnecessary force, uh, witnessing a immoral and unlawful act, they are bound by our policy to intervene. And that intervention may be physically stopping the other officer. It may be reporting what they saw or heard to the, either their supervisor or to our internal affairs unit or our integrity unit, but they must take some type of action if they witness one of these incidents happening. Um, and if they don't, then they could be held just as liable as the officer that committed the offense. So we wanted to put some teeth in policy. So we made it very clear to every officer of the sheriff's office, whether it's corrections or police, that if you are witnessing something that you know is against our policy or against the law, and you just stand by idly while it's happening, you're gonna be held accountable as well. And like I said, that happened, that policy change came shortly after the George Floyd incident. And it's been in policy since probably the fall, right at two years, about September of 2020 is when that policy came to effect. Um, next slide, please. Um, our mental health training. So uh, with our mental health training, um, that's a huge area. And we do give a, we do what we call CIT training, crisis intervention training, which is a 40 hour program where we bring mental health folks in um, to talk to our recruits, to teach our recruits, um, to give them the tools they need to identify someone that may be suffering from a mental health crisis, um, how to respond, how to stay safe during these incidents, and how to protect the citizens as well. Um, we give them the tools they need to learn how to do a Baker Act. There's a very limited scope of authority police officers have to Baker Act someone. And a, what a Baker Act is, is basically it gives law enforcement the legal authority to take someone into custody and take them to a mental health facility, either based on statements or actions they've taken or witness statements from a family member of someone. So if they said, hey, I heard Travis saying that he's going to kill himself and he's going to kill everybody in his house, based on those statements from those family members, an officer can take someone into custody and then deliver them to a mental health facility uh, for their own safety and for other safety. Um, 
Well, I always like to, when I talk about mental health crisis and mental health training, you know, we give our officers the 40 hours of training there, then our officers get continuous training every year on mental health crisis. And the question always comes up is, do you think that's enough? Um, no, it's not enough, okay? Um, but how much is enough? So, and what I like to do is give the analogy of, you know, I'm trained in first aid. I know how to do CPR. And if someone went down right in front of me, yes, I'm going to administer CPR right away and start doing that. But I'm also going to call for the professionals. I'm calling for the rescue. I'm calling for paramedics. I want them to come. And when they get on the scene or if there was a RN on the scene or a doctor on the scene, I'm going to let them attend because they have more medical training than I have as a police officer. The same thing applies when it comes to mental health crisis. You know, we give our officers a baseline of training and we build on that training year after year. But our goal in law enforcement is to get that person that's having that mental health crisis, get them to the trained licensed professionals because they have so much more training than we have. Uh, one of the things that we do here in locally in Jacksonville, we have what's called the co-responder program. And with that co-responder program, uh, we have a licensed mental health counselor riding with police officers. And we have about 12 right now. And, you know, get it, it's a large city, but this is a pilot program that started roughly about a year and a half ago, and we're up to 12. But we're putting the medical mental health counselor professional in the car with the police officer so they can have that quicker response to someone that's in a mental health crisis. Because unfortunately, you know, we get called, law enforcement gets called to these mental health calls, not when the individual has missed their medication day one and they're still, you know, pretty rational. We get the call when they've been off of their medication for 30 days and it's two in the morning and they're doing something in the middle of I-95, and that's when police have to come. They're in full crisis mode, and it's dangerous for them. It's dangerous for us. So what this program helps us do is get that mental health counselor on the scene, just like we would get fire and rescue on the scene, someone having a medical crisis. We want to have that licensed professional on the scene as well. And so when these co-responders aren't um, responding to a call in progress, they help with referrals with long-term care. So if they're a, they can talk to the family members. You know, if we know we go to this house once a week because there's some type of mental health issue there with an individual that lives in the house. What can we do to, that's a long-term care fix? So law enforcement is not continually going back and back to this house because obviously having a mental health issue is not a against the law. Uh, so we can't arrest them. So what can we do from law enforcement using the resources that the city has or nonprofit organization has, what can we do to provide some type of long-term care where we're not continually getting called? Um, they help with medication management, contacting the homeless population. Uh, as we all know, or probably aware of, there's several people within the homeless population that offers, also suffer from some type of mental health issue. So we try to work there and then obviously they assist with police calls. So that's our co-responder program. Um, I know it's the mission of the Sheriff's Office to try to to expand that program where we have coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So, but that is going really well and we're seeing the benefits of having those folks in the car with those police officers um, when they're going to these types of calls. And de-escalation. So I, I hear we have some, uh, Buck, I, I got the chance to read up on you guys on the uh, the website and that's a very, that's a very, um, great program that you have going on up there in Virginia. So that was very cool to read about that. We have something similar down here called Cure Violence, but de-escalation training. Um, yes, we do it. Um, we follow, um, there is a group called the Dolan Group that they have a curriculum that we push out and we are um, following that. That's what we train our officers. We are in the middle of transitioning to a different program that's a nationally known program um, to give our officers some more de-escalation training, to give them some more training. Um, and so our, I'll try to explain this so everybody can understand. So we have a 16 hour block of de-escalation training, whether the officers learn nothing but de-escalation. But what I will try to get you to understand is that de-escalation training is done throughout the academy. So for example, when we're teaching our recruits how to do a traffic stop, 
we teach them that, hey, to introduce yourself may reduce the anxiety of a driver when you first walk up. So you're de-escalating the situation. If you're investigating the domestic violence incident, if you tell the wife to go in the one room, you tell the husband, hey, step outside and talk, to, talk with me. You're separating the two parties. You're breaking the eye contact between the two parties. You're de-escalating the situation just like that. So although our training block for de-escalation is 16 hours, there's a little bit of de-escalation in everything that we do. Um, just the officer's body language, their presence, their tone, how they speak to people can de-escalate a situation. So we put a lot of effort into doing that and how our officers relate to the community itself. Um, building relationships with the community members, those influencers in the community, that helps de-escalate the, the situation. If I can walk on the block and, and the kids in, that work or, or are out there playing, they know, oh, that's, that's Officer Cox. We don't need to be worried about him because he comes out here all the time. They know me. That helps de-escalate the, the situation. So de-escalation training is something that's ongoing and it and it's never stops here at our academy and then once the officers get out on the street. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, racial bias and profiling. That was another topic that came up. And I believe I have that uh, policy on the next slide. Those are kind of like my topic slides there. Yeah, so again, so I know definitions can vary from agency to agency. And what does bias-based profiling or racial profiling mean to one person uh, may mean something different to someone else. So I wanted to start talking about this topic by putting up what's in our general orders as how does the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office define bias-based profiling. So detention, interdiction, or uh, disparate, uh, despairing treatment, uh, any person based on their race, color, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identification, and everything else you see there, that's how we identify what bias-based profiling is. And that is strictly prohibited and you know it's one of those things where we talk about the duty to intervene if another officer sees that or if something that is caught on the body camera that the officer is wearing um, that can be up to a fireable offense depending on what transpires so we do have a a we do have a policy uh, about bias base and racial profiling uh, we enforce that policy um, Again, we're a large agency. We have over 1,800 police officers and then another close to 600 uh, correctional officers. Um, the question always comes up to me, well, you know, this incident happened or that incident happened. So um, do we catch every incident that as it happens? But no, but we rely on the community to let us know about incidents as they happen. And then we rely on the officers to report those incidents when they see them happen as well. So that's what our, our bias-based profiling uh, policy is within the sheriff's office. I believe that's the last slide. Yeah, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed to hear about the expansion of the training, especially the um, crisis intervention and expansion of the de-escalation. I pray that that makes a difference in some of the things that happen when people are, are going to get arrested and they are combative. Yes, we think, uh, we think we're on the right track with that. And um, we have to continue to work at it. And one of the things that um, we know we have our younger workforce. We've hired a lot of officers over the last five to six years. Like uh, two thirds of our agency has seven years or less on the agency. So uh, we know we have to push this type of training out continuously. And uh, we have to be intentional about pushing this type of training out because usually when, you know, the bad things happen and when we see these incidents happen around the country, it's usually when the officer is trying to make an arrest and you know, there's a little bit of confrontation. So if we can give them some more tools to de-escalate the situation, or if they know the person they're, they're dealing with has some type of mental illness, and we can get a more trained professional that deals with mental, mental health on the scene quicker, 
we know that's something that we need to do. And if there are no more questions, thank you so much, um, Officer Cox. It was great hearing about all the training and the um, impressive effort that Jacksonville, the Sheriff's Office is doing to increase um, certain aspects of their training. I will pass it along to Vivian to introduce Buck Squad. Hi, right, so now we can to move on, I think Mr. Dickerson is here with us today to discuss some of the work that Buck Squad does in Charlottesville with de-escalation and violence interruption. Is Mr. Dickerson on available to speak about um, the Buck Squad now? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank oh, you. okay. I was talking and I was on mute. I'm sorry. No worries. How's everybody doing? I, my name is Herb Dickerson. I'm the executive director of the Buck Squad, which is an antonym for Brothers United to Cease to Killing in Charlottesville, Virginia. At the end of 20. 19 there was a series of murders two women four guys in like a six-week span here in town and we got together and we had to do something to stop the shootings and stuff inside of some of them were gang related and some of them were domestic so a group of guys got together and i kind of hand picked from the litter guys that i knew were from the streets had been in the street had criminal records mm -hmm. all were doing better now had turned their life around and what we do, we go out and canvas the area of Charlottesville, which don't ex necessarily mean minority areas because they shoot all over Charlottesville. So sometimes we're in the university area, sometimes we're out on the 29 corridor. So wherever we hear that a gun has been fired or is potentially to be fired, what we do, we go out and develop relationships in all these neighborhoods. We don't discriminate because gunfire can come from anywhere. I mean, you have drive-bys all over the country, so you just never know. And we've been pretty successful the last 18 months because we haven't had a murder since. So we've been dealing with a lot of domestic violence. We have found like three or four missing kids. We deal with rape victims. We have a psychologist on board to deal with the mental health issues. I personally take folks to substance abuse treatment if they need that. But the de-escalation is the most important part. And what we find out is just a lack of communication. Some of these folks are ex-gang members or want to be gang members and somebody else is orchestrating what they do. So we get to the leader of these gangs, cause I mean, they're selling drugs, they're gambling, they're doing all sorts of things on the street. So we try to de-escalate anything that could be a potential shooting situation. And we've been very successful at doing that for the last 18 months anyway. We had a five week, we had a, no, it was a five day training. The director came from Chicago himself and trained us how to do this. Cause one of my guys, when we first started, we just went out there roughshod, just talking to folks and a gun was put in his face. One of the guys that worked underneath me and it was a scared situation, thank God it didn't shoot. But that's when we found out that we needed a uh, training. You know, we operating on emotion, but we are not thinking and to put them in a harmful situation. But since then, we haven't had a murder. We have very few shootings. I think when I look at the stats the, uh, last week, we had, had 41 gun interruptions so far this year in South Korea alone, 41. And what we do, we have talked to the victim, potential victim, we talk to the potential shooter and we get them together and see if they can talk these situations out. Some may, some may not, but it hasn't been in the murders. So that's pretty much what we're doing here. If y'all have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. I have a question. Um, so I guess, 
it seems like a very complex um, system that doesn't happen overnight. So I guess, could you speak more to how um, you guys developed like a good process? And then also, how do you find out about these situations? Well, like I was saying- Turn camera on, Herb. Oh my, wait, wait, wait. oh, I'm sorry. There I go. Okay, like I was saying earlier, we, we create relationship in these minority communities, but we people reach out, we have a hotline number, a 24 hour hotline number where people may call and say it may be a potential for a gun shoot. So I sent two guys out to check out the situation and maybe, I mean, it could be up to 15 on the scene at any given time. So it's just a relationship. That's the main thing. We relate to develop relationships all over. That's not the biggest city. So it's not hard to cultivate relationships. Oh, because gunshots have been happening all over this town. So we found somebody in each one of these neighborhoods and they talk to the people, other neighbors and they find out that, wow, somebody just drove by shooting and we'll get the call. Sometimes I get called from the rescue squad that's been called. It just depends. But we have real strong relationship in our community, especially the university community. So we usually find out what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and where it's going to happen, and actually get to the people involved before it ever happens. It's just a blessing. It's scary. I tell you, it's scary. Sometimes we up to three or four o'clock in the morning, and it's a scary situation because we don't care no gun, but we all are ex-offenders. So we've been in the street life. So we know the street life. We know how these folks think. We know how these people act, especially when they're under influence of drugs or alcohol. And you, one of my guys would know somebody in that particular group where they can actually talk to that person. Because I mean, if you think about it, most victims don't really want to get shot. So they want some kind of in the, in de-escalation, whatever it may come from. And most of the time they'll have a better understanding once we talk to them and let them know I mean, we law enforcement is coming. You know what I mean? If you shoot somebody, somebody going to the hospital and somebody going to jail. Now, it is it really that big an issue that you want to risk your freedom where you can't take care of your family, your children, your loved ones about some bullshit, really? And I had to put it that way. A lot of times it's just bullshit. But these young guys don't know. You know, they got this drill music they listen to, they got this gangster rap to listen to, and everybody want to be somebody other than themselves. So we had to kind of put them back in their place, you know, and it's an ongoing thing. It ain't like a one-time intervention. We connect with them, we mentor them. We got a guy just getting ready to open up a re-entry program because a lot of the violence coming from the penitentiary to the city. So we're trying to cover all the bases where we can potentially stop anybody from getting shot and killed. Because you list an innocent bystander that's going to get shot. That's usually the case in the end of the shooting. So we try to stay ahead of it. And people call, you know, people trust our judgment. They always see us in the community. So they know nine times out of 10, we come in. I mean, we canvas every night. So we always somewhere. You just don't know where. But we may have already gotten the call and be, you know, so we just try to stay ahead of it. Any more questions? Oh, Hello, Mr. Dickerson. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Dickerson. My name is Kira Nixon, and I serve as a community um, liaison with our state attorney's office here in Jacksonville. What we're having a problem is um, a lot of the crimes, especially violent crimes that's occurring here in Jacksonville, tend to be with a group of young people between the ages of 14 to right. like 21. But it's hard. So we have a program, but it's hard um, to have those relationship um, aspects because a lot of the people that's in our program that we have here in Jacksonville, they tend to be a little bit older. What's some advice that you have with how to get to talk to the youth and trying to de-escalate situations when it comes to youth between the ages of 14 to to 18 or 19 years old. Well, well, if you think about tracking them, what's attracting them to that environment is guys that came before them. Some of them grew up in the house where the father, mother, cousin, uncle, 
were involved in gang violence or drugs, di distribution or stuff like that. So they learned that the first teacher is in the household. The first teacher, your mother and your father. So whatever lifestyle they leave, it's what the kid gonna pick up on. If your mama is an alcoholic or drug user, and he feel embarrassed, he feel like he got to make a name for himself because he don't want to be associated with the parent. Then he gonna pick up a gun because he join a game because he want to be in the street. He want to be somebody. So we develop relationships within the community. So because there's other people that know these children, we have the same problem here. We had the same problem here. I'm talking to a 12 year old now that every time I see him, he got a gun. It's just a matter of time. And I've known he'd been shoot it, but he hadn't shot anybody away. I, I mean, you know, we don't turn people into the police because if we do that, we destroy our reputation in the community. That's where we draw the line. We, we just don't talk to police because the people won't trust us with information if we do that. Mm -hmm. We just, thank God been successful not to have no shooting, but that's why we don't, we're not known to do that. So you just, you, have to develop, you just have to develop a relationship in your community. I don't think anyone want to see a kid getting shot versus or oh, adult, but it got to be some kind of conversation about this. Everybody know what's going on. You may, they may act like a number of people know what's going on in their own neighborhood, you know, and they know why, but they just have this relationship that the police has created where it's a separation. Because now you know you talk to the police, they'll come get you just for that. So people don't want to be seen talking to the police. I can tell you how many calls we get. We probably average 50 to 100 calls a week just because people don't want to talk to the police. And it'd be about everything. It'd be about everything. Some stuff that we really don't even do. We don't do rape victims or domestic violence, stuff like that. But all of it has potential for gun violence. If you know somebody would rape your daughter, what do you think it's for thing about doing? You know what I mean? So we have to intervene and hopefully talk to, talk them down. You know, I mean, that's a hard thing to do when somebody assaults your family member. But we get it done because we just won't let them go. You know, like the lad general was saying, we get them separated, you know, and have this conversation. It, it may take three or four hours sometimes. And then we check with them the next day and the next day till we feel that the issue has been resolved. That's a lot of work, hey, man. Thank huh? you so much, Mr. Dickerson. Thank you. I mean, it, it, you can do it. I mean, but, and cure violence will send somebody there to train people in your neighborhood to show you how that's being done. COVID don't have any problem getting on the airplane from, I mean, he may be anywhere, but he'll come. Because he's so, it's hard to just say, you know, because you hear about all the killing in Chicago, the neighborhood where he lives, there's no killers at all. I ain't saying that he stopped all the murders in Chicago, because you just pick an area. You know, Chicago really big. You probably put Charlotte in Chicago three or four times. So they just pick a neighborhood to stop. We just trying to stop the, all the shooting in the whole Charlotte area we can have, because it's usually the same type of individual that we just happen to know. I don't know if it's helpful or not, but that's the way we do. No, that's very helpful because it typically is, again, um, relational. And it's, probably gonna, it's getting worse. I mean, you can see, you can, I mean, let me give you an example. Like, let's just say the, the, your vow is you. Now, you saw how scared those police were, right? See, yes, people sir. the police or the day the police scared too. See, that's a bad message that they sent when they didn't go in that school and rescue them kids. Everybody's talking about the police. They got all this artillery. They scared too. So now people don't feel protected. That's all over the country. They ain't just there. All these schools. I'm, I work with a group. Y'all probably heard of Mom Demand Action. They are a national group that's trying to get these gun laws changed and have got some change. I work with that group. And all they talk about is how we can stop these school shootings. So who you think in the school? 12 year old to 17, 18 year old, right? They carrying guns to school here in Charlottesville. We know it, we just can't catch them at the school with the gun, but we know it and we will eventually catch them. 
but that's not our job. That's the police job. But I mean, I don't know what happened to the police department. I ain't gonna talk down on them, but I just don't know. I just don't know. Something happened to change dynamics of what they do. So now when we are, we don't even see police. I don't know. They think it's our job to do this. But we care about our community and the people that live in. That's what motivated us to do it. We just got a hundred thousand dollars from the Department of Justice who recognize the work we do in this little town. And we can take this training all over the state. That's what we plan to do. Yeah, but it's 12 years old to 17 years old in every community. It ain't just here. They're all over the place and they're raising hell. And that means that, you know, hurt people hurt people. If you think about it, hurt people hurt people because they don't know how to deal with the pain. So they act out. It just so happened they use these guns and so easily access to guns. Nobody won't talk about that. You know, you're talking about you can go change the gun laws in the stores, but what about the street where we get guns from? We, I can go leave my house and have a gun in five minutes. And it's all over the country. They ain't just Charlottesville. This is all over the country. Black people don't buy guns out of the gun store. They buy them on the corner. Anything you want. That's how bad it's got. But see, bullets don't have no name. Once you leave that chamber, it goes straight. And if anybody in the way, they're going to get hit. People need to understand that innocent bystanders get killed with the foolishness. I mean, ain't nobody out here taking no target practice. That's why they buy automatic weapons. Because that pop, 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 pop. If you hit, shoot five, six times, you're going to hit the target eventually. They don't have no training. That's why they buy them. A revolver that shoot one time, you got to aim it. If you got an AK-47, all you got to do is pull the trigger. Bop, 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 bop. How you going to miss? It's sad that we came to this state. It's sad. I never thought in my life, and I used to participate in violence years and years ago. I never thought it would get this bad. I never thought it. It's a sin sick country we living in, man. This country going crazy. In all areas, we just going crazy. I don't know what it is. We got the high drug use in the world, the high alcohol use in the world. So the people are delirious and the mental health issues that you did with, what do you think going to happen? This is just the beginning, really. This is just the beginning, man. You better protect yourself and always watch over your shoulder where you are, who you're around. But they don't discriminate. Anyway, that's where I'm at with. So um, with Buck Squad, um, have you guys had any situations where de-escalation did not go to plan? Yeah, yeah, I had a few, yeah. But so, we still got the conversation done and we still have an ongoing conversation and they decided they were, they were going to have, I mean, we got boxing gloves in the trunk of some of our cars that they just want to fight it out. We allow them to do that, supervise. Something, something chose that path, but if you chose that path, that means that once the fight is over, you got to shake hands, hug, and you're going to have to stay together for two days. This is what you signed up for. You got to stay together for two days and go to an elderly person's house, take them to the grocery store, cut the grass or something like that together, and it hasn't been no shooting. It just hasn't been. The, the grace of God, I guess. But there hasn't been no shooting. We have all kinds of mechanisms. Because see, it's a lack of communication. And economics. Economics is the main reason. People getting robbed, want to sell drugs, gambling. And they delusional. I mean, you using drugs, you don't know what you might do in the next five minutes. You just don't know. Because your brain is just twisted. And they being trained by other gang members, that's how to recruit they tr recruit the younger guys because the younger guys ain't going to get as much time as the guys with the record. So they'll let them hold the drug. Let them sell the drug. How much time are you going to give a 12-year-old? You understand what I mean? You can't send them to a man's penitentiary and let's keep repeating, repeating, and repeating their friends. So why wouldn't I give it to him? He'd like to get us some tennis shoes, nice car, and you see him wear all this jewelry and stuff like that. It's a sickness, man. It's a sickness. You you got the glitz and glamour, but they don't tell you the whole story about the penitentiary, and you might not survive that. You know what I mean? This is some deep stuff, man. I've been through it all. I've been to federal penitentiary and state penitentiary. 
so I know what they think. Can you talk a little bit, um, Herb, about how uh, the Buck Squad was trained to do de-escalations and how yeah, it's implemented? Say that again. I said, can you talk to them a little bit about how the Buck Squad was trained to do de-escalations and then how that was implemented after the training? Yeah, I was, I was telling them earlier that you remember, Brian, when we, we were, at, when the Murders happened in Charlotte, but we were really acting on emotion. It may have been 20 to 30 guys that, man, we're going to put a stop just to kill my nephew, to kill my cousin. And we just went roughshod out in the community. Man, y'all got to stop us, you know, and wouldn't nobody listen. One guy, like I told him earlier, had a guy, my assistant, had a gun put in his face. Man, if you don't get the hell off this block, I'm going to kill you. So we fell back and we got. Kobe Williams, who was director of Cure Violence in Chicago, come and train us for five days. And he taught us how to separate the parties, develop relationships in the community, and find out a lot of the stuff happening and then why. But a lot of stuff we know what's happening before we even post the folks. We know the whole story. Because they'll tell you, yeah, such and such did, such and such don't kill him. What? That's the only answer you got in your mind and we just been doing that like i said for the last 18 20 months so also um can you tell them a little bit about how kobe's training told you to focus on like one community so you're able to see kind of results and things like that just kind of the structural the structural um program how that works just because not everybody is familiar with Charlottesville, yeah. just in case they I, want to try to implement it in their area. Yeah, I was telling, I was telling them about COVID himself being from Chicago, and all of you know that's that that's the crime capital of the United States, murder capital. But what he focused on is just the neighborhood he lived and grew up in. He couldn't stop all the shooting in all over Chicago. He just it's just not enough people to go around. So he just focused on where all the hot spot was. In Charlotte, at that time, it was First Street. Hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. It was the First Street neighborhood, one of the housing projects in Charlotte, where four of the murders occurred. So we picked that neighborhood. And then we went to the second most, which was West Haven, over off Main Street, where you saw something you probably heard last summer where some shots were fired in West Haven and hit the building, the University Student Housing up on Main Street. And then the third was Garrett Square. See, all these guys associate in all these different names, so we kind of follow them. And a lot of times we stay ahead of them. But all the hot spots where somebody's actually been shot and murdered, this spot, first street, our number one area was gambling, every night they were drinking and drugging on the corner every night and no police no police so they actually had hired security a security company to take care of this area the security guards were there when the four people were murdered i don't know where they were on the complex but they were happy to be there so we just do what we think is best based on our training we don't put ourselves in harm way, but you just never know. We don't care no guns, not allowed to. So it just be so many of us. I guess you they figure if you shoot one, you gotta shoot ten. I don't I don't know what they think, but they never shoot them. I mean, we've never been approached since with no violence or even thoughts of violence. Yeah. Most of these guys that need somebody to talk to need a father figure. And some people that, like I said, I've been there, done that. So a lot of guys on my team, all of my ex-offenders, all have been there, done that. So we understand. We know the conversation to have with these young folks. Yeah. Most of them, we know the parents. We know exactly, really, most of them, I can tell you how they got that way. I know who raised them and everything. So the people in the community tell us. Um, I have a question. Um, if do you um, see a lot of mental health issues in the field when you're working on when you approach a scene of a conflict, and if so, how do you deal with that? All, all of my mental health issues. 
if you got in your mind to kill somebody, you got a mental health problem. I mean, that's just standard reason, right? And then you couple that with drugs and alcohol. You ain't taking your medication, you self-medicate. So who knows what that may take the brain? So yeah, we have a psychologist that we can refer folks to. Yeah, I take I do drug treatment stuff myself. I've been doing that most of my life. So yeah, any resource you may need, we're gonna provide it. Yeah. But mental health, man. <laughs> It's hard to find a person now that ain't dealing with mental health issues. I mean, see, like ever since the COVID, like people just went crazy, man. You know, they won't used to being locked up in the house a year, two years, and when they came out of their house again, and like a whole new person. It was uh, it's, it's amazing to me. But I pay close attention because I don't want to get shot. <laughs> I really don't. But I won't stop it. And I may die trying, but I won't stop as much as I can. Yeah. I know you got some more questions. Come on. Say it. Just say what you think. There's no such thing as a dumb question. I guess um, you had said, like, it seems in your community that you have felt like you've taken on a lot of responsibility that the police officers um, had. Do you see, like, a way that you guys could partner and work towards a safer community together? No. With how it currently is? No, 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 no. Cause, let me explain to you. The confidence that we have got people understanding from us. We cannot talk to the police. It would destroy the confidence. People don't like talking to the police because their own reputation that they created. They created this by the shooting and the stuff they do. So people rather not call the police because the police come, somebody going to get hurt or killed then. You just don't know how the police going to react, so they just don't trust them. They just don't trust them. They don't trust them nowhere in the country. They just don't. They trying to revive these relationships they have, but as you heard some of the officers say earlier, they, they, they people ain't just talking to the police, man. That, you know, these guys are just silly, silly as hell, but they call it snitching. And that's a cold industry was derived way back when I was in the street. You just don't do it. But most of them want some type of intervention, but once they hear the word go, they go to the target and want to finish what they set out to do. We just try to be there the man, come on, man. You got to look at this a different way. Because you go and pay attention to the rest of your life. Who's going to take care of your daughter, your sister, your mother, your cousin? Who's going to take care of all these people? And then they got to take care of you. Then the victim, if they don't die, they may be paralyzed. It's sad, man. I see, I've been shot. It's not a good feeling. I had to push under my arm and rip my whole arm out. Five inches away, the doctor said it hit me straight in the heart. But some foolishness I was doing robbing somebody. That's about 30 years ago. So I understand the complications that come with the mental health mind. I understand it. But I also understand we have interventions in place that can help you look at it another way. And we we go to the bitter end, to the bitter end, to stop it. It's hard. Can't know anybody do it. I mean, even with the training, if you hadn't been from the street, you probably wouldn't even catch on to the training. But all of everybody on my team been in the street, been in the penitentiary. My assistant did 21 years for a murder. He didn't commit the murder, but he got accused of being the driver or something like that. So these guys have been doing us, man, we know. And every community got these guys and we just got to organize, get them to train it, and we can stop a lot of this stuff. But they ain't gonna stop by emotions. The police can't stop it. They just come after shooting been done. How in the hell do they know? They ain't got no uh, places they can go where people gonna get them information like this to stop this kind of stuff. 
People don't want to be talking to the police. Yeah, they got crime stops and all that here in Charlottesville, but they ain't talking about potential murder. You may say, yeah, such and such over there selling drugs, some because they paying them to call them. We ain't paying nobody. We just trying to save lives, and people believe that we really doing it because we have been doing it. Man, we got gang members that argue and want to fight every day. Trying to make a name for themselves is foolish. It's scary, man. Your whole mindset. That's all you want to do. I got a body. You see the guy with a little teardrop on the eye? That means you got a murder. And they can't, they're so proud to get that tattoo on the eye, man. It's crazy. And you ask me, is there any mental health problem? What? What else can it be? You're going to put a tattoo on your face the rest of your life. I know someone got five and six on this going right down the eye. Murder. It ain't fun dealing with these folks, man. It's almost like you got to retrain the brain. You can't do that overnight. You just take a lot of intervention. Yeah. What keeps you going every day then? Ah. Ah. <coughs> if I had to pick, well, let me get a little history on myself. Like I said, I've been to state and federal penitentiary. I was a heroin user about 35 years. So I know all the complications that come with being in the street. I've been doing all my life, New York, California, Florida, Miami, Philadelphia. I've done all this. Thank God I survived the gunshot. That's the only time I've been shot, but I've been stabbed every couple of times. So that was my prior life. When I got clean back in 2001, I said, man, I'm gonna change the trajectory of this city right here. So I started working with people with HIV and AIDS at that time, because back during that time, people with AIDS, the number were rising because of intravenous drug use. So I started discussing abuse care. I ain't never been to school, but I know, because I've been there and done that. Started to, I'm taking hundreds of people to treatment, hundreds of people, still do it. Took one Friday. So I learned my lesson in the street, school of hard knocks, they call it. So I just didn't have a hell of a reputation in this town for the things I used to do versus the things I do now. People see the change in me and want to help me do what I do. They know I can. So that's what motivated me. Number two, I have four granddaughters. Two daughters, four granddaughters, that I do not want to see them in harm's way ever. Because they be in all these communities too, playing with little kids and stuff like that. And like I said, gunshots, they, they don't have a trajectory where the bullet's going to go. I don't know what I would do if somebody would hurt somebody in my family. I don't know. But to prevent it is why I do what I do. I just want to prevent it. I'm on, I mean, I'm on, I'm on university campus all the time. Y'all probably see me up there. We always, because there's a lot of <clears throat> unreported rapes and stuff going on at that University of Virginia. We know it. We know the whole history on the University of Virginia. A lot of unreported stuff. A lot of crime happens on that campus. It goes unreported. But we know it because we're from here. So we try to be wherever we need to be to stop anybody from getting hurt. And I mean, I don't know if it's a dollar amount you can pay on paying somebody to do that. I don't know. So what is what would be the price of your life? You know what I mean? That's why I look at it. So I don't want to take a bullet for no amount of money. I don't. And I don't want to see none of y'all take one. So that's why I do. You know, we don't discriminate. We all over the place. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Does anybody yeah. else have any um, more questions for Mr. Dickerson? Okay, well, thank you. Um, I was wondering if Assistant um, Chief Cox is still on the line. Yes, I'm still here. Okay, so I was wondering, um, you had mentioned that we, in Jacksonville, that there's a cure of violence. 
Um, so I was just wondering what that partnership looks like with um, the JSO. So it's somewhat similar to what's going on up there in Virginia. There is a channel of communication between JSO and Care Violence, but we don't interact with them on a daily basis for the same reason that Mr. Dickinson um, mentioned. Uh, they basically lose credibility if, uh, you know, if they're out there and the individuals out there in the street feel as if the Care Violence folks are just basically snitching on them. So um, there is a channel of communication that happens between JSO and Care Violence, but they pretty much operate separately from uh, the sheriff's office and they're actually funded, they get their funding through the mayor's office. They don't actually work for the sheriff's office. That program is ran through the mayor's office. Is this Jasper Bay or are y'all talking about? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, okay. And do you see any, um, I guess, areas that can be approved, like whether it's more collaboration or um, just any areas of improvement, whether it's on the cure violence side or the JSO side or just more communication between the two? Um, so I'm not the right person to ask that question because I work in the training academy. So I don't deal with that unit at all. So I, I couldn't really, you know, intelligently speak to that. I know the program is still going on, and I know that we have uh, a civilian employee that is that link of communication between the uh, care violence folks and the sheriff's office. How that program is going, the day-to-day -day of it, I just don't know because I don't deal with it day-to-day. -day. Do you see any decrease in the, in the violence in your town, though, because of the care violence organization? Well, that I don't know, sir, because oh. kind of like, like you said that they do in Chicago, you know, Jacksonville is 864 square miles. So each of the two or the three cure of violence groups, they have like a couple square mile areas. And since I'm not involved with that on the day to day, I'm not sure exactly where their areas are, or what their data looks like right now. Oh, OK. OK. I just thought maybe you hit on the news where you would see a decrease in gun violence. Uh, I, I haven't. I haven't because they don't they won't say, well, you know, if a shooting happened or a shooting didn't happen, the news won't report, well, this is a cure violence area or not a right. cure violence area. Right. That's why we don't get a whole lot of attention because there ain't no news because there ain't been no shooting. That's why we don't get a lot of news. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. But thank you, man. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for what you do up there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, before we close, I was just wondering if um, each of our speakers could give us, I guess, um, some good final words to close us out. Um, I can start with Sergeant Chris Jones. Got to unmute it. Hey, um, yes, so last thing I'll say is from the recruiting standpoint, if you know anyone in Jacksonville or really anywhere, um, we recruit all over the United States. So if you know anyone that may be interested in getting into law enforcement, whether it be in corrections, working in our jails, a uh, community service officer helping with traffic stuff and crashes or being a police officer here or any, anything, dispatcher, uh, working for us in any capacity, please send them our way. We'd love to talk to them and see what we can do to uh, to get them employed and they can be kind of part of the solution if if you will that's it thank you um lieutenant derek boucher good evening yeah i just want to echo what uh sergeant chris jones said so if you're interested in joining an organization that is um forefront and community focused and um, being a part of the community and not being separated, JSO is the place to be. So if you have anybody interested in that or think they would be eligible to join us, uh, feel free. JoinJSO.com is the website that you go to get those uh, qualifications. Thank you. And Assistant Chief Cox. Okay, well, let me first say thank you for uh, having us here tonight. Um, hopefully, 
everyone was able to learn a little something about JSO and how we do and what we do and how to apply. Um, I tell my folks at the Academy all the time, my instructors, I have a great staff. Um, and I tell them all the time, our goal is to build the best training program possible. We want to have the best training program possible. And we try to put as much as we can in those nine months while we have those young men and women at the Academy to prepare them for the streets. Um, law enforcement is one of those industries where you can never teach them everything. So we have to be always be continuously training and continuously learning and adapting. So we try to do that. We try to incorporate our community with our training. Um, so if you're ever interested in coming out to the Academy, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to put my information in the chat, how you can get a hold of me. We have a Citizens Academy. We do a Teen Academy during the summer. Um, we're all about letting you learn what it's like to be a police officer and give you some of those scenario-based training stuff so you can see the other side and that maybe give you a different appreciation for what we do and how we do it. But thank you for having us. Thank you. And Mr. Dickerson. Wow. Well, what's important to say is everybody keep having these conversations and why is the police go, and you hear stupid ass people say, defund the police and all that foolishness. That is the dumbest shit I ever heard. What are we gonna do with those police? I mean, really man, it don't even make sense, but I'm sure we can get better police, you know what I mean? Well, we can get better people in every field of endeavor that we need in this country. We just need to improve the environments and stuff we live in. And I don't give it take police, community organizer, or whoever it take, uh, a violence interrupter, whatever it take. But we got to have these conversations because ain't nobody talking, man. It surprised me. Matter of fact, I got off this podcast about 45 minutes ago because all I was hearing was police bill. I said, what am I on here for these folks? I couldn't understand, but now I understand it. Because they have the same issues that all of us got to stay alive. And we have to change the, the, the trajectory of our children. And somebody got to get in their ear and say, man, it's got to be a better way. It's got to be a better way. If it doesn't, this is going to continue to happen. It's a false sense of pride out here, these young folks. They really don't know what they're doing. And like I said, you know, these gang members are putting guns in their hands and sending them out there to the street to take care of business. But they ain't telling the whole situation. They're not telling them the whole situation. Yeah, you may shoot somebody. But number one, somebody may shoot you back. And you go in a penitentiary. And you don't want that, man. They really don't want that. They ain't built for that kind of stuff, man. So these police don't even know. Soon they do something, they come running, telling all kinds of stuff. So to keep them going to jail. Everybody know how that game go, man. But we just got to get in their ear. I don't know if you're going to go through the school or how you're going to do it. But if, like I said in the beginning, the parents are the first teacher. And we got to start getting these communities organized against this violence. Yes, they're gonna wipe the whole country out, man. I mean, they killing people now like it going, like it they ain't nothing to it. Like it ain't nothing to it. And you ask me, is this a mental health thing? What else could it be? If that's the only option you have is murder, there's something wrong with you. And you need some help. And we just gotta get in the help. And that's what we're trying to do up here in Charlottesville. Well, I thank you, I thank y'all for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, and I think uh, Jerry put a question in the chat um, with all the conflicts between youth um, beginning online. Is there any effort to monitor things before they escalate into violence? And Assistant Chief Cox, um, do you want to speak a little bit more to that? What you put in the chat? Yes, yeah, so so we do have detectives uh, in all the different units that, um, especially if we know, like, say, there's one rival group going against another that will monitor social media, we'll try to intervene. Um, we have actually worked with the state attorney's office before and were able to actually charge people 
with if they're posting like a YouTube video with guns in the video and we find out that they're convicted felons and they can't legally possess a gun, we were able to actually uh, get arrest warrants for those folks in the in those videos and make those charges stick. So yes, in the short answer is yes, we do do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Caroline, Vivian, is there anything else that you want to add? Um, I do not think there is anything else, but I wanted to thank all of the speakers from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and those from Buck Squad, Mr. Dickerson and um, Ms. Kimberly Hayes. I really appreciate, I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, anything you have to say, Vivian? Yeah, just um, to echo Caroline, I'm very grateful that you all could make it here tonight. And I think this was a really great conversation. Here we go. Well, um, I'll close this out. So on behalf of the Jacksonville Urban League and its Center for Advocacy and Social Justice, I would just like to thank you all for coming out tonight and especially to our interns, Vivian and Caroline for um, gathering you all here tonight. And um, if you would like to join us in future conversations, we will be hosting another um, engagement circle on the 29th. So um, more information to come, but thank you all for joining us and have a great night. Thank you.